I don't know if this is a new song or not to some of you guys, but um, I, I've sung it a lot. I love it. So. One day I looked up and I saw Yeshua coming. One day I looked up and I saw Yeshua coming down the road. Shalom. Hey, have a seat. Uh, you know what? We are just, we're really short crew, and apparently that's because some of them had to dry out from, from eight days of rain. <laughs> it, was, it was wet out there, but you know what? It was really good. It was really good. We, we saw uh, relationships mended. We saw relationships built in a, on a deeper level and it was just amazing i watched one night as as people were ministering to each other in tears it was just amazing um as i was watching i, I thought wow if this is not him here i don't know what is you know what i mean it was wonderful it was just awesome and um as as a form of announcement uh, I was told to remember October 6th is the life chain, the silent prayer for, uh, for pro-life here in Salem. 
And if you have any questions about that, see Sharon. Um, she would love to be able to give you that information, when it's going to happen, and how we can be involved in the whole shot. Another thing that we're involved in is a bomb shelter that we're going to be refurbishing. And in fact, what we did was we actually sent um, the whole amount of money to them, and they were going to refurbish a bomb shelter um, now, and then they were going to refurbish one when we got there. Well, guess what? This morning, I have video of one of the families that they are going to refurbish now. And so uh, I'm going to get I'm going to get Mike back there to uh, you have to change it back to the other one. That's why. OK, um, if you'll give me can you can you play that song again and let me bring it up? I'll get back and bring it up. Can I, who knew that song? One day I looked up. Anybody at all? Anybody ever sung? Okay, that, okay, that's one person. And that's my mom. So she knew. She, knew, she was clapping too, I think. I, I heard her clapping. Um, but that song is like, um, it's one of my favorite songs. And it's just, because uh, one day, you know, like the last part especially, you know, we'll see him coming, and I just, it gets me excited when I sing that, so. So let's sing a few verses of that. It's a simple song, so it's easy to pick up on. One day, I looked up, and I saw Yeshua coming. One day, I looked up, I saw Yeshua coming down the road. Hallelujah, He is coming. Hallelujah, He is here. One day I looked up. up and I saw Yeshua dying on the tree. Hallelujah, I'm forgiven. video now. Okay. A month ago when we were uh, bumped here in the area, everyone were in uh, a great panic. My wife especially and my daughters hearing the bombs is not something that uh, you would like your child to, uh, to hear, to do, to experience. Um, the big one was actually born during uh, the previous war in 2006 when we had to uh, flee we left to Tel Aviv and she was born in Tel Aviv the next war would be uh, harder Tel Aviv would also be one of the targets at the moment not having this room uh, ready for war just uh, gives another panic there are no beds the room itself is quite small so uh, adding the facilities to make it comfortable to sit here would ease everything up and maybe calm the girls and my wife and everyone around here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
My name is Aaron. This is uh, Nati, my wife and my two daughters, Yuval and Yarden. We live in this uh, building in Aria. Um, in Aria, being in the front line is constantly the, f the first uh, place to be bombed whenever an issue comes up. Um, just one month ago, we had, uh, we had a few bombings in this area. Um, not having a shelter is a big problem for us. Uh, at the moment, we don't have a place we can be for a long term. If, if anything comes up, we can sit in this room for maybe a day. It doesn't have what it needs in order to hold long terms. Um, what else? We want to thank you for your help and uh, you can see my little lady children and I was very worried about them and now I can sleep very quietly, I think. Thank you. Yeah. For those of us that are going over there, remember these faces because we're going to be able to meet them this spring when we go. So, it, it, and their shelter will be have, will have been done by that time, and we'll be on to another shelter. But when we go, we're going to have uh, meals with all of these families, and so the kids that we'll get to meet the kids there and and everything. So it's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun, and as as it progresses. Uh, Ronnie is going to send us more videos so that we can show it up and show how it's progressing and, sh and so forth. But this is just one of the families in an interview from one of the families that, uh, that we got. Yes, um, they'll be putting bathrooms in their bunks and, and, and so forth so they can sleep and, and of course, eat and, and uh, you know, use the facilities as well. So, um, so yeah, they're going to be working on all of that. That way, no matter how long the attack can goes, goes on, they can at least have uh, a livable space to protect them. So um, I wanted to make sure we got that. How about if you all stand for scripture reading? Psalms 118. Gives thanks to Yahweh for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let Israel say his faithful love endures forever. Repeat that. Let Israel say his faithful love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his faithful love endures forever. Let those who fear Yahweh say his faithful love endures forever. Father, we just thank you so much for this time that you've given us today that we can come before you and lift, our, lift our, our voices in our hands up to you in praise and worship because your faithful love endures forever. Amen. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see you Open the eyes of my heart, Lord Open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see you Open the eyes. 
presence, O oh Lord. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, Yahweh. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And renew a right spirit within me. For anything that is not of you is of me. I want more of you, and less of me. Holy fire, burn away my desire. of me empty me empty me fill me with you with you holy fire my desire for anything that is not of you but is of me I want more of you less of me For anything that is not of you is of me. I want more of you, less of me. Empty me. Won't you empty me and fill? Father, we just, I just pray that today, and I know that everybody's probably in agreement with me that um, you just empty us of those things that um, we're blind to, Father, that, um, that we don't even see. We don't even see. We, it's just we're totally blind. We need your mercy. We need your love to show us and reveal us. Re reveal to us, Father, those things that... Um, that uh, our sin in our lives, but but we don't know it, and we just need you to to search our hearts, Father. Purify us, please, please have mercy on us, Father. We ask today. Purify my heart. Let me be as gold and precious silver. Purify. Let me be as gold, pure gold, refine as fire. My heart's one desire is to be holy, 
set apart for you, my master, I choose to be holy. Set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. Purify our hearts that may be as gold. be as gold, pure gold, refine as fire, my heart's one desire is to be holy, set apart, for you my master I choose to be holy. Ready to do your will Purify my heart Cleanse me from within And make me holy Purify my heart Cleanse me from my sin Deep within Refine as fire, praise you, Father. My heart's one desire is to be holy, set apart. For you, my master, choose to be holy, set apart. For you, my master, I'm ready to do your Cleanse me from within and make me holy. Purify my heart. Cleanse me from my sin. Deep within, praise you, Father. Refine as fire. My heart's one desire is to be holy, set apart for you, my master. I choose to be holy, set apart for you, my master. I'm ready to do your will. Yeshua, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Yeshua. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other found I know. Nothing but the blood of Yeshua Nothing can for sin atone Nothing but the blood of Yeshua Not of good that I have done Nothing but the blood of Yeshua Oh, precious is a flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain, no nothing.
Nothing but the blood of Yeshua The blood of Yeshua is enough for me The blood of Yeshua is enough The blood of Yeshua is enough for me The blood of Yeshua is enough This is all my hope and peace Nothing but the blood of Yeshua This is all my righteousness Nothing but the blood of Yeshua What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Yeshua What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Yeshua How about if we get some men up here to hold the tallit uh, for the children? And bless the bless the children. Hallelujah, our children. Do you stand and you put your hand out to the children as we bless them? May Yahweh protect and defend you. May He always shield you from shame. May you come to be in Israel a shining name. May you be like Ruth and like Boaz. May you be deserving of praise. Strengthen them, Yahweh, and keep them from the stranger's ways. May Yahweh bless you and grant you long lives. May He send you spouses who will care for you. May Yahweh protect and defend you. May Yahweh preserve you from pain. Favor them, Yahweh, with happiness and peace. Oh, hear our Sabbath prayer. Amen. May Yahweh protect and defend you. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give the Yahweh a hand for our children. Turn with me in your Bibles today to John chapter 4, John chapter 4, and we're going to be taking a look at verses 29 through 38. And if you remember, two weeks ago, uh, we took a look at John chapter 4, 27 through 28. And you know, um, really, if somebody would have talked to me about the book of John and asked me, what, what's the summation of it? And I would say, well, I would have said, well, you know, 
it's about Yeshua being Messiah, and it's about his blood redeeming us. And, it, it, and that would be true. But I want you to know something. There's a deeper issue in John that we have to look at. And, and I think it's, it's very important for us to look at. And it was the issue of provision. It's the issue of provision. Because all through, as we've gone through um, John, and we even, as we took uh, a look at the first sign, we could have called it the first sign of Messiah, and it is, but we could, as we look at all of this, we need to look at what is happening not only in Yeshua coming, but also what he's trying to show us. And what he's trying to show us is that, you know what, we spend a lot of time trying to provide for ourselves. Trying to be good enough. Trying to do this. Trying to do it this way. Trying to do that. And it really becomes religious in nature. When we're trying to do it, when we're trying to bring a covering for ourselves, it's, it's religion. That's what, it's, that's what it becomes. We saw this in the clay jars. I mean, in the stone jars. In the, in the first one in, in Cana. We saw that, that, uh, that this was, these storm jars that they used for washing feet was, was man's attempt to really clean himself or make himself clean. And it was those stone jars that Yeshua turned the water into wine, representing his blood, saying, no, my blood, the blood of the lamb is what cleanses you. Not the water that you wash with feet. We, we saw this woman at the well. It was the same day. It, right from the get-go, he talks to this woman, and he asks her for a drink, and she says, you have no bucket. You have nothing to provide for yourself to get the water. Do you hear what she's saying? You can't provide for yourself. She's telling Yeshua that he can't provide for himself. Because you know what? It's, she's like all of us that look into the natural things. And he said to her, he said, if you understood the gift that was here, you would ask him for water and he would give you living water. Now remember, we talked about that word gift being, in the, in the original language, the root word being sacrifice. And he was saying, if you knew the sacrifice that was here, that was offered for you you would ask him for a drink and he would give you living water and you'd never thirst again you know this woman that had these five husbands and was living with one was looking to have a covering for herself she was wanting to have that covering she was longing to have a covering and she was willing to do anything to get it i suspect that we're in the same boat today. That some of us, and, and probably most of us, because you know what, I'm pretty sure that she didn't see what she was doing wrong. I'm pretty sure that she was blind to it. And I'm pretty sure that we're blind to some of the places in our lives where we're still trying to provide for ourselves. But Yeshua cut to the heart of things. You see what he said? He says, you've said the truth. You said, you've rightly said that, you, that you're not married. She didn't even tell him that part. He says, isn't it true that you've had five husbands and the one that you're living with now is not, you're not even married to? And she talked about worship. She talked about other things. But in the end, you know what she talked about? Is that she left her stone jar at the well. And she went to tell people about her provision. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, I want you to hear this. She left her provision at the well. She left it there. 
so that she could go tell other people about the provision that was sent from Yahweh. I got a question for you. It's easy sometimes to come here or to go wherever and to listen to someone speak and, and to worship and to do all these things and not really make it about us as individuals. We could say, oh, that was stirring worship or that was a stirring message. But can we say, does it apply to me anywhere? And what I'm saying in this is, are we looking at ourselves and saying, what area of my life am I still trying to provide for myself? It may be different for each of us. Some of it, it may be financial. Some of it may be we're doing something with family, trying to make it happen. Do you know what I mean? I, listen, man, I, I've butted my head over family forever, trying to force them to, to, to do the right thing, right? It didn't for me. It didn't work for me. Uh, well, what, di what it did for me is it usually ticked everybody off. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then you're going, I'm just trying to get you to do right. Why are you mad at me? Because you're pushing us, Right? You're trying. You're doing it. You're doing this. You're doing that. Right? I am not, I am not their Ruach HaKadosh. I need one myself. I need him myself. Amen? My job is to tell people the truth and let the Ruach HaKadosh work in their heart not to try to force them to do anything. You see what I mean? And so sometimes that's our provision. Sometimes it has to do with husband and wife. Sometimes it has to do with things. Right? Sometimes it has to do with our happiness and our joy. You know, I, I've listened to, to people that have talked to me a lot about the, that they just don't sense joy, that they're depressed. And they, they are completely thinking that, it, that it's just about a physical thing, and so they're taking drugs to try to provide for themselves. When the fruit of the Spirit is what? Joy. <laughs> right? Not depression, joy. So it has to be a spiritual thing that affects us physically, right? And when you look at this, what, what we're trying to... Have you ever tried to love someone that you didn't love? Have you? Yeah. How did that go for you? <laughs> right? But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Right? Because I'm loving with his heart. I'm, and that's one of the things that we talked about this time at Sukkot, is that, you know what? When he, he tells us throughout Scripture that I'm not giving you a different spirit, I'm giving you my spirit. I'm giving you my life. I'm giving you who I am. And it, it, talk about Yahweh, not me. You don't want my stuff, right? You want him. Right? And so if we have him, we have his heart. We have his love. We have his joy. We have his kindness. We have his patience. Right? Somebody asked me one time, he says, why are you so patient? He says, you're, they said you're patient to the, to the extreme. And I'm saying, but is it patience, one of the ruach? Proof? Yeah, and I said, is there some place where it lim limits me on patience? How patient has he been with me? Right? I mean, I, I keep get, expecting I, to get the eviction notice, right? 
hey, you're out of here. But he doesn't. He's patient with me, and he keeps coming along. He keeps working with me on, on some of these issues, right? And he does with you as well. And you know what he did with this woman at the well? Because you, you remember the, the time that they brought this gal caught in an adultery before Yeshua? And they were going to stone her? I don't know where the guy went, by the way, on that one. So, but anyway, uh, he must have got out of Dodge really quick, you know. But they drug her out. Did he draw the first stone? You know what he said? He said, the one without sin casts the first stone. Now, I got to tell you something. That kind of leaves me out, right? I wouldn't be able to throw that rock. Right? And so this whole idea of us trying to do something is, is really foreign idea to him. Because he wants us to allow him to do it through us. And that is so hard to do, isn't it? Man, I tell you what. Every time that, that I, I think I'm going good, I kind of go, yeah, I got the idea. Step in. I, I can do this. And I get in his way. Right? Watch your, grand, watch your grandkids and your kids. They do the same thing. You'll show them how to do something, and then all of a sudden they got it. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Don't they? And you watch them mess up. And they're going, it didn't work. Yeah, it did. It works when you do it right, right? <laughs> and that's what I'm saying is that we have to allow him to do it. We have to learn to be submissive. And one of the things I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about it again here in a minute, is that, you know what, in Philippians 2.8, it's talking about Yeshua being humble. It does not say that he was humble when he became a man. He says it was humble when he, became, when he was obedient. That kind of stopped me, because we've all been taught kind of that he humbled himself to become a man, and that may be true. But his scripture says that he humbled himself by being obedient. So the definition of humility would be what? Obedience, right? Obedience to him, obedience to his life, obedience to his spirit, obedience to his heart with one another. Completely foreign idea sometimes to be able to stop and say, okay, I'm about to enter into this who's, with whose life, with whose heart, with whose spirit am I entering into this situation? Amen. So let's read John chapter 4, verse 29 through 38. It says, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They left the town and made their way to him. In the meantime, the disciples kept urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said, I have food to eat that you don't know about. The disciples said to one another, could someone have brought him something to eat? My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work, Yeshua told them. Don't you say there are still four months, then, then comes the harvest? Listen to what I am telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields, for they are ready for harvest. The, the reaper is already receiving pay and gathering fruit for eternal life, so the sower and the reaper can rejoice together. For in this case, the, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that you, what you did not labor for. Others have labored, and you have benefited from their labor. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time that you've given us. I ask that as we go into this, this next uh, portion of, of your scripture, of your word, 
that you just show us exactly what it is that you would have us uh, to look at in our own lives. I thank you for this in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Yeshua is our, soar, our sower of good seed. Here, the statement is important for us to get in, here in verse 29. She goes to this town and tells everyone, he told me all I did. And interestingly enough, she makes another state, strange statement, if you will, could this be the Messiah? But it appears that she may have been using Scripture to judge who Yeshua was. Okay? Turn with me to Isaiah. Eleven. Verses one through three. Then a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of, of Yahweh will rest on him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and of the fear of Yahweh. His, his delight will be in the fear of Yahweh. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. He will not execute justice by what he hears with his ears. Okay, and, and we'll stop right there. It says there specifically that this Messiah that comes forth, this root of Jesse that comes forth, is the, has, will have the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, and the spirit of knowledge and fear of Yahweh. So when she says this, when she goes to this town, when she leaves her provision and runs to this town, her question is more of a statement. This could be the Messiah, because he fits the prophetic scriptures of who Messiah is going to be. Because he told me everything I did. He looked into my life. He'd never met me before. He never talked to me before. But he looked into my life and he could tell me what was in my life. Now, my question to you is this. When she was sitting at that well, and as Yeshua was looking into her life, and as Yeshua was willing to address the things in her life, how many of us are willing to sit there and let someone speak into our life and expose what's there? But I'm going to tell you something. If we do not allow him to judge our lives and expose what's there, we cannot have the provision that he brought, brings. If we do not keep our feet to the fire and allow him to expose us, then we will not have the covering that only he could bring. He did the same thing with, with Adam and, and, and Eve. Remember? Say, Adam, where are you? I'm here, I'm hiding. Why are you hiding? Well, because I'm naked. Why are you naked? Did you do what I told you not to do? Yes. You know, I'm going to tell you something. Do you remember when you were a little kid and your parents knew what you'd done? And they talked to you about that and they said, did you do that? No. Right? You may be even holding it in your hand. No. <laughs> Wasn't me. Right? And my parents knew that there, was a, there needed to be a punishment because I wasn't even admitted when I got caught red-handed, right? But you see, if we don't let him judge us, we don't let him... See, we all think that judgment's bad. Don't we? The word judgment means go to court, go to jail. Right? 
But in his economy, judgment's good because it's the only way that he can bring us to that place where we're willing to say, I'm a mess. I've tried everything there is. And I can't fix it. That's where I came. That's the place that I came in my life. Do you know what? I ran from Yahweh and I did everything I could but turn to Him. And you know what? I'm telling you to this day that I have marks on my body from running from Yahweh because He used it to slow me down. And He used it to show me my life. And he used it to, to make it to where I had no other option. He hedged me in to where I had no other options but to look at my life. And when I did, I couldn't stand it. And I, that's why I didn't want to look at it, because I knew I, couldn't, I wouldn't be able to stand me. But it was only at the time when I realized that I could not stand it and I could not do it anymore, that I would listen to him. And it was that place where he said, I can fix that. I can do this in your life. And you know what? I'm pretty sure that woman at the well was in that same place. She couldn't even, the people wouldn't even be around her. She was probably in a place where she was saying, I don't even know what to do anymore. Maybe the reason they were divorcing her is because she was barren. Can you imagine how frustrated that, frustrating that would be for her? No one would stay with her because she couldn't have children. Maybe she couldn't cook. Who knows? Right? Bad cooking at one point was, was okay for divorce, right? Say, that's the last salmon you're going to cook, okay? <laughs> we had salmon last night, and she did well. She did very well with it, so... So Sharon's not on the list. <laughs> but it, she was probably at her wit's end. She made this, this, uh, this journey to the well by herself to try to cover for herself. She'd been all doing all this because, because she'd been listening to what was righteous. Right? In men's eyes. But do you know that, that Yahweh looks at men's righteousness as filthy rags? And so here she was, and she could say, I've tried to follow all of the religious talk, all of the religious rules, and here I am, I, I'm an outcast. And I've tried my best. And we find out, and she begins to find out, that it's only through Yeshua can we have any righteousness. It's only through his life. Because he is our righteousness. Amen? And so really what we're looking at, that we're, what he's targeting, is he's targeting our efforts to, to be righteous. He's targeting our efforts to, to, to cover ourselves and to be what we think that we should be. And many times what we're told we should be. Right? Church, many, much of church doctrine says, says certain things that this is the way you've got to be. Cornerstone had one at one time. We tossed it. Had a covenant that you signed that said, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do that. And you know what? Here was one thing. <laughs> you couldn't buy, sell, or consume alcohol. 
And I thought, are we going to be cops and go check everybody? I said, and it's against what Scripture says. Scripture doesn't say this. Right? So that's a form of self-righteousness, isn't it? That's a form of our righteousness, isn't it? Come on. Some of the other things that you can't do. You, women could not, could, only could wear dresses and no jeans or no pants in the assembly. You've heard of these, right? What's that about? They probably need one that men can't wear dresses, right? This is all a form of man's righteousness. There were, there were, and, and that's what he begins to talk about. That's what we talked about two weeks ago was that there were sayings, that there were oral traditions that said you couldn't even talk to women, that it was, it was a degrading thing to talk to women, and that it would lead you to wickedness. I went home and tried to show that one to my wife, and she goes, you try it, go ahead. Right? See where that gets you. He says, I cook now. I won't then. <laughs> but isn't that right? And that's where she was at. And here's somebody that comes to her and looks into her life, without condemning, by the way, and says, hey, I see you've been doing all these things. But let me tell you about a covering that you can receive that isn't according to all of this. You don't have to try to do this yourself because I want to do this for you. I'm the gift. I'm the sacrifice. You see what I mean? He wants to come to you according to Isaiah chapter 11 verses 1, two, one, one through 3 as the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of knowledge. And he wants to look into your life, not so that he can condemn you, but so that he can save you and me. Not so that he can, he can put you down, but so that he can give you a righteousness that only he can give. Do you see what I mean? So she goes to this, she, she, she gets it, she starts getting it, and she runs to this town and she says, hey, could this be the Messiah? Now, it's interesting, because she, she recognized the, at, at, those attitudes, and, and now the, 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 she tells them, at, she, there's a word, let's go back to, the, to John 4, uh, 29, it says, come see uh, a man who told me everything. Now, this word told in the Greek is epo, and it means to answer, to command, but it's from a root word, femi, which means to show or to make known one's thoughts. So there's no doubt that this word used was about a prophetic utterance into her life. You see what I mean? And the connection was not just to point him out, but to make his thoughts known to her. Now this word, listen to this, this word is related to another word in the Greek called lego, which means to break silence, but lego is tied to another Greek word, which means logos, which means divine expression. And it's in, connected, it's in connection with the inspired word of Yahweh. And the inspired word of Yahweh means, inspired means the breath of Yahweh. The whole purpose was to speak into her life, to speak the spirit into her life. Do you know when he speaks the spirit into our life, he begins to reveal things about himself that we need. He begins to show us how our stuff is not working and how that only He can provide those things. So as He began to express, as He began to talk to her, He began to impart His Ruach, 
which revealed to her the truth. You know what? As hard as that day was in my life when he revealed the truth about me, that's what I long for him to do in my life always. I don't, want to, I don't want to live life and then come down to a point and realize that I've lived it wrong again all those times. I want to have him reveal the truth to me about me each and every day to where I know what his will is in my life. Don't you? You see, this whole thing wasn't an accident. So, so the idea is Yeshua is able to divinely see into our lives and tell us what's there. And that's how she presented this to the people of the town showing the work of, the work of Messiah. So based on what, on what she said, the whole town uh, came to see. They left town to see the one that she was talking about, the one she claims is Messiah based upon his insights into her life. Meanwhile, back at the well, okay, his disciples come, have been there. And the disciples were trying to get Yeshua to eat something. And he tells them that he has food that they aren't even aware of, and, and, to do the, and that food is to do the will of the Father. Now, this isn't Yeshua's first time with this saying, okay? Let's... let's uh, Let's look back at um, Luke chapter 4. Verses 3 and 4. The devil said to him, If you are the son of Elohim, tell this stone to become bread. But Yeshua answered him, it is written, man must not live on bread alone. Now this is interesting because it actually ties back into Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Let's look at verse 3. He, hum he humbled you by letting you go hungry. Then he gave you manna to eat which you and your fathers had not known, so that you might learn that man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of, of Yahweh. Hmm. How many of you had seen that connection before? That he was quoting that. And, he was, and it's in direct reference to the manna. That was given to him, right? This is awesome stuff. Is, so he's speaking of this, this bread that came down to heaven. Notice that going hungry was a humbling process. Okay, and it was done as the father d does a son. This is about learning process so that we would learn not to live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh. Now, this is interesting because the, le the lesson to humble themselves and to rely on every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh was learned in the desert. Did you get this? It was learned in the desert, but it was not for the desert. It was for living in the land. Look at Deuteronomy 5 through 11. Keep in mind that Yahweh your Elohim has been disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. So keep the commandments of Yahweh your, your Elohim by walking in his ways and fearing him. For, for Yahweh, your Elohim, is bringing you into a good land, a land where streams of, of water spring, springs and deep water uh, sources flowing in both valleys and hills, a land of, of wheat, barley, vines, figs, and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land where you will eat food without shortage, where you will lack nothing, a land whose rocks are iron and fr from whose, whose hills you will mine copper. When you eat and are full, you will praise Yahweh, your Elohim, for the good land he has given you. Be careful 
that you don't forget Yahweh, your Elohim, by, by failing to keep His commands and the ordinance and statues I am giving you today. Listen. The stuff that we're doing now, depending on Him and trusting in Him, is not for today, but it's for when He takes us into the land. Do you get this? Because when we are fat, dumb, and happy, we forget the commands. But he's saying, I'm going to teach you how to live and trust in me for, for my provision so that when you go into the land, you're still trusting in me for my provision. That's awesome stuff. Because you know what? It gives a goal, right? Because we're not out here. We don't have to be out here whining. Oh, I'm so tired of manna. Because you know, the truth is, is he's not going to let us go in until we learn to trust him. Because we have to trust in him over here too. Do you get this? This is about a daily walk trusting in him. It's about a walk that says, you know what? I don't have to worry about where this is going to come from or how this is going to get done because I know that Yahweh will lead me on the path and will show me how He's going to do it and will provide for the things that, that, that we don't have. Come on. You know what? That means that I don't have to worry about covering myself. That means I don't have to worry about, about, about him looking into me. That means I don't have to worry about it either. It's because what he's trying to teach me is not about harm. It's about prospering me. And the way I prosper is by trusting in him for his provision alone. Then I prosper. Is this boring stuff? Not to me. Because this begins to show us the path that we need to be on. Right? This is amazing stuff. Because you know what? It, it begins to show us his heart. It begins to show us his mind. It begins to show us his vision for his people. Amen? His love. It begins to show us his heart. That whole fruit of the Spirit thing, it begins to show us who Yahweh is. And Yeshua is, right? So this lesson that we're learning now is all about what I'm going to be using the rest of my life for eternity. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapters 8, verses 13 through 16. And your herds and your flocks grow large, and your silver and gold multiply, and everything else you have increases be careful that your heart doesn't become proud and you forget Yahweh, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. He led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its poisonous snakes and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water. He brought water out of, out of flint-like rock for you. He fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers had not known in order to humble you and test you so that you would in, he would end he might cause you to prosper listen this whole idea about prospering is is that we need to do it his way we need to allow him to, to we need to put our trust in him and allow him to be our provision because only listen to me only then can we prosper You see, we think that prospering is having more ourselves. 
when in reality, prospering is, is having Him provide for us. Did you get that? He will proper, prosper us. And what He says is, is when I do prosper you, don't get proud and think that you've done this. He says, I want you to remember where this came from. And that if you want to continue in this, you have to continue to trust in me. Do we want to prosper? Evidently not, right? Can we get together on that? Do we want to prosper? Okay. Then we have to trust in him to be our provision. It's the only way. And when he prospers us, we have to trust in him to be our provision. We can't get proud, and we can't say, I've done this. You see what I mean? Because we didn't. Now remember, I, I talked about Philippians 2, 6 through 8, about Yeshua humbled himself and became obedient. And he didn't humble himself such by just becoming a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient. The word obedient in the Greek is hupeikos, and it means to be attentively listening. But the root word means also to take heed to a command. Sound real similar to Shema. Listen and obey. Right? Shema Israel. Yahweh. Do you get it? And that's what he told him in Exodus 19. Listen to this carefully. This is why this is so important. Look at listen to, to Exodus 19. Verses 5 and 6. Now if you listen to me and carefully keep my covenant, you will be my own possession out of all the peoples throughout all the earth, is my, even though all the earth is mine. And you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. These are the words that you are to say to the Israelites. If you shema, Right? We find the same thing happening in 1 Peter chapter 2, where he says, you will be. You know what? And that means that we have to shema. We have to listen. We have to listen not only by hearing, but by obeying. When we, what he's saying is that the word listening isn't just about hearing him, it's about obeying him. So when I hear, it means that I've taken it in, put it in my heart, and live it out. And interestingly enough, when, when back in back in John chapter four, now this is this is even this gets the same way. He talks about he, the disciples talk to him about this food. He tells them he has food that they don't know about. the 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 Greek words for food or meat in the King James is different from um, in in verse or chapter four verse thirty two and John verse thirty four. Let's, let's, let's look at this. John chapter 4, verse 32. But he said, I have food to eat that you don't know about. Verse uh, 34. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. Okay? Now listen to this. The, 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 in verse 32, the Greek word for that food is broes, and it means to eat or a food in in that you might be speak any food that you might be speaking of, they urge him to eat the food that they had brought. Okay? In verse 34, the work is Brahma, Brahma, and it is different it, it's it in reference to ceremonial food that's allowed according to Jewish law. Now, Hebrew word, okay, for the same word is Basar. And we find this word being used in passages such, such as Exodus chapter 12, verse 8, the, the flesh referring to eating the Passover lamb. In fact, this word is used 61 times 
in Leviticus. And is, it is most often used in conjunction with eating the sacrifice. Eating the set-apart food. Do you get this? Okay, let's go back. Your nation of priests. Who is allowed to, who is allowed to eat the, sacri- the sacrifice? The foods? Huh? The priests. The Levites, right? It wasn't for everyone. The Levites. But what he's saying is if you'll listen and obey, I'm going to make you holy priests. What he's saying, I am a priest after the order of Melchizedek, and I am eating the ceremonial food, which is the will of my father, and so I'm well fed. Man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that that proceeds out of the mouth of Yahweh. That is our ceremonial food. That is what we need to be satisfied. He knows we need the other food and he'll provide. But he wants us to choose every word that comes out of the mouth of Yahweh. That's our satisfying word, food. That's the food that nourishes us. Do you get that? Then Yeshua changes a little bit. And he goes off and and he begins to talk about that you say that there are four months that comes from the harvest. The harvest that he's referring to is the barley and wheat harvest. This conversation that he's having with them most likely took place in December, January time frame. And the four months would, would have been, would have been uh, the, the, the barley and wheat, which, which would have been brought in to wave for the first fruits. Yahoo! He's looking at the crowd coming that she brought in that had listened to her, to her word about this Messiah. He's looking at him come in and he's telling his disciples, look, look at that food. It, look at that harvest. It's ripe. It's ready to reap. He said, pray for the workers to come in and reap that. He says, because you did not work for that. He says, but you're going to reap. And he says, both of you will have joy because of the fruit that's brought in and waved before Yahweh. He said, this is what... We need to have a hunger for that fruit, that harvest to come in so that we can wave it before him with joy of a harvest that he supplied. You get that? He's the sower. The Ruach's the one that sows the seed. We just talk and we just tell people because he is working through us. It's him. So we're reaping the harvest that he sown. Do you get this? And we ought to be joyful about it. We ought to wave it before him in great joy of what he's done for the harvest that he's brought in. Amen? This is amazing to me. Because all this time, all the harvested and all of the festivals that he's done, all of these things represent what he's trying to do. The gathering of who? Israel. And it ought to bring us great joy. You see, that woman went forth and she told them about a provision that would provide for them. And they came to see. They came to see. And what he's telling his disciples is this. Hunger. Hunger after every word that comes that proceeds out of the mouth of Yahweh. Because that's what will feed you. He says the rest of it will provide, I'll provide for. 
He says, be, be hungry after the harvest. Be hungry about gathering Israel in. He says, because I've already told you that I'm at work. I already told you that I would be gathering Israel in. You ought to be hungry for it. See, I told you that I was going to do this. He said, I told you that I only came for the lost sheep of Israel. I told you these things. He said, so be hungry for what I say. Be hungry for, for, for the word that come. He is the living word. He is the living Torah. That's the sign we have out in front of the, 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 the foyer up there, whatever you want to call it. That sign up there is that he is the living Torah. Be hungry after me. And be joyful when the harvest comes in. Be joyful to go out and reap the harvest so that we can wave it before Yahweh. Any questions? I have one. So um, when you when you um, when you learn all these things because they're things and God is our provision, we learn things here because we're going to use them in heaven for eternity. Is is that um, does that refer to that laying up treasures in heaven? Is that what that is? Mm -hmm. Okay, because sometimes you hear or I've heard, you know, people um, they lay up treasures by. By just stuff. I, I mean, I don't know. They might help someone, but, but it's more of a we're laying up treasures by what we do here. Right. Okay. Yeah. I was just on the harvest because um, I have been able to pick. I have about 200 great plants, and it's they're ready. You know, they're they're ready to be picked. And we have a worker, a couple workers, and they picked a bunch of grapes, and I was I was just enjoying. I was picking them the grapes off the cluster because we're going to make raisins out of them, but I just thought I'd comment because I, I was enjoying doing that. I didn't harvest them. The, the guy that picked them did. But when you have a bunch of fruit in front of you, you're like, wow, this is so, this is, I mean, look at this cluster. It's huge. And you're picking it off and you're just enjoying it. I didn't, I didn't, I grew them, but I didn't, I didn't harvest them, you know. And it is, it is fun to harvest grapes too. I love to pick them too, but even if you don't pick them, you're just so enthusiastic when you see the fruit. You're like, wow, this is, look at that. Look, you know, look at this one, look at that one. And Anyway, it is, it's fun just to see the fruit and see the, 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 the you know, the, the harvest is cool too, but the, but the fruit is, is also good. So. And, and you know what? That fruit represents people. And it turns out he loves people. Okay. Anyone else? So I, ha I have a question. So when he, at him, when he says um, there are yet four months and then comes the harvest, mm -hmm. so is that the, the fall harvest that he's talking but about that's yeah, going to be, be coming in the... four months? Right. So then, so then if you count four months prior, which it would be his time? Well, I mean, no, no, no. He'd be talking, because if that was, that was around the just before first fruits were waved, so it have been it would have been Passover and then first fruits, you remember? Okay. So, so I was thinking it might have been at around the time of Pentecost, because he was talking about the spirit. And then when you went to Isaiah and it's just, you know, the spirit, you know Right. Uh, and and I thought, oh, could that be could it have been around the time of Pentecost that he was talking this? Well, he, he then, would have been talking four months, so would, if, if that was first fruits, then it would have been uh, four months, three or four months before Passover, and then go into first fruits, right? And then you go from there to count the Pentecost of 50. So, 50. <laughs> I got in a little bit late, but just considering what Yeshua did with the woman at the well, I, I saw something. He looked like he was presenting the Torah 
to her or the parts that she failed in. And you know how we're to look and, and read it and, and see ourselves and, and then not forget what we're like. Well, I think all of us should be able to look into the Torah and say, well, I failed this, I failed that. And, and, and it brings us to him. And that's, I, just in a real short version, it looked like that's exactly what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And, and was part of that, too, is not just to see where we fail, but, but it would be to look deeper as to areas that we might be trying to provide for ourselves, and that brought about the failure. Yeah. So we're trying to cover, you know. Rick, this is really great because I think so much I have always thought of the provision more materially, and what I see here is the, he is the provider for my spiritual and emotional growth. He is, and he, he's also, you know, if we follow the example there, he's also the provider of everything else, too. So, yes. But it's, I, I think that what we do oftentimes, and because, because our physical needs are, seem to be, look as if they're more pressing, if you will, um, you know, because we feel them stronger than sometimes we feel the spirit, that we oftentimes try to provide ourselves with meals before we do uh, spiritual, um, that spiritual idea. You know, and that goes back to atonement. Why are we looking at ourselves? It's because, you know, um, am, I, am I trying to provide and cut? How many of you know about comfort food? Yeah? What does comfort food do? It gives you the warm, fuzzy feeling, right? <laughs> and you feel good, right? Well, sometimes we eat because we feel good. It makes us feel good, right? And, and we do that over, over trying to savor the word, in which, according to what he says, should be the first place in our life. That should be where we're getting fed primarily. And the rest of it, he provides. You see what I mean? So it's kind of like, okay, am I, when I feel bad, when, I, when something's going on, and I recognize something's in my light, do I run to the refrigerator? Or do I run to him and to his word and before him? You see what I mean? And I'm not saying that all of you need to do that. I'm just saying that that's a good example. Because it, when, we, when we try to provide ourselves, we're dulling, we're dulling what we're feeling because we, it makes us feel bad, right? And so we try to cover that ourselves. When in reality, we need to face it with him and let him feed us. I'm sorry. Um, verse 37. Okay. Since he's talking to the disciples, it says, for in this case, you're say the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. Right. I sent you to reap what you didn't labor for. So that would be the Samaritan woman was a sower. Well, actually, and the Yeshua disciples, was a sower, Yeshua she, was a sower it, but yeah. she added to she that took seed. seed out, yeah. yeah. And so we are to be both sowers mm -hmm. and reapers. Exactly. And so we can give as, as, um, as he gives to us, we can give to others. And in the... When we went back to Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, talking about manna, in the Olive Tov Bible, Olive Tov is in front of manna, mm -hmm. which is Yeshua. Right. So just, just he says, kind of a I side am the bread note. of life, the bracha. So I'm the bread of life. You know, so, yeah. You know, speaking of that, how many times do we, are we studying or maybe in a service or somewhere, and, and we're given the word, which is the seed, right? And we hoard it for ourselves and don't spread it. Right? This woman took the seed and went out and shared the seed in the field. You see? So it was, it's amazing. And I think we're all guilty of that. So. As some of you may know, I love James. Really? Um, <laughs> but chapter 1, verse 22, basically says, Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Because if anyone who is hearer of the word does not, and not a doer 
is like a man looking at his face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom, of freedom and pre preserves it is not a for forgetful hearer, but one who does good works. And he'll be blessed in what he does. So it's... Anyone else? <laughs> the one little thing you just said reminded me of something when you said he gives us, you know, he provides for us this spiritual food so that we can give to others. But, and, and so it, it's just such a correlation of he gives us, he provides for us spiritually so that we can give to others. He also provides for us physically so that we can give to others. Yeah. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah. So, so many of us, you know, we take and we hoard. And really what he's trying to do is I bless you and I prosper you. Now, now prosper others as well. You know, give to others as well. So, anyone else? How about if we stand for the blessing? And he always spoke to Moses, Moshe, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This is how you bless the children of Israel. Say to them, Yahweh bless you and guard you. Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and show favor to you. Yahweh lift up his voice upon you and give you peace. Thus they shall put my name on the children of Israel, and I myself shall bless them. Yivarechecha Yahweh v'yishmarecha Ya'er Yahweh panavalecha v'chunecha Yasaha Yahweh Panavalecha Vehasem lecha Shalom Bring us back to you, Yahweh, and we shall return. Renew our days as of old. Amen. You are free to go out and bless each other. <laughs>